Hey, everyone. Hey, Brian. Hey, Dr. Becky. Hey. Hey. So good to see you too. Everyone out in the live stream, thank you for being here. Please put comments and thoughts into the live chat. And with that, I guess uh, we will kick it off. Cool. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Brian. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Aren't you going to do like the. I, 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 yes, I did. I have to figure out. I forgot what the episode number was, but uh, okay. 234. <laughs> it's always different every time. It's so weird. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 234, and it's May 19th, 2021. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I'm Brian Aachen. And we have our special guest, Dr. Becky Smethers. Welcome. Hi, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to introduce myself then. I was like, mm, should I jump in? This is, this is, this is standard <laughs> fare for our podcast. We we do a bad job preparing our guests for jumping in. Welcome. I love casual podcasts. They're my favorite to listen to, and they're now my favorite to be a part of as well. <laughs> yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah, so it's it's really good to have you here. And you know, you're doing so many neat things out on the internet. Uh, First of all, you're an astrophysicist at University of Oxford. Uh, that is my day job, technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've written some books. You can tell folks about that. Um, mm -hmm. You are doing quite a bunch of interesting things over on YouTube, which is how I came to know you. Uh, your work on YouTube is really neat. And yeah, maybe just tell people real quickly about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm an astrophysicist. Um, my day job is essentially to study supermassive black holes and figure out the effect that they have on their galaxies and how it might they might stop their galaxies from forming stars, which is kind of awesome. I'm living the dream that I had as an eight year old mm -hmm. to become like a an actual space scientist. Um, and yeah, I just love talking about science and space with people as well and I've sort of found my niche a little bit on YouTube really that I can put out videos each week about fun things in space or even react to you know old sci-fi and stuff like that about what they got right and what they got wrong necessarily and it's just a great platform to communicate with people and respond to people's like questions that they've never been able to google you know the tagline is your friendly neighborhood astrophysicist so <laughs> yeah I, I absolutely recommend um, that people check out I don't know why that doesn't work. I absolutely yeah. recommend that people check out your YouTube channel. It is super neat. And yeah, there's there's a ton of fun videos there. They're, they're very good sort of general science, just like interested in science, not scientists type of uh, presentation. So mm -hmm. super cool, super cool. All right, Brian, you got the first item, right? You want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Um, Dustin Ingram just recently released a an updated version of the... Uh, an article called uh, Powering the Python Package Index in 2021. Uh, apparently there was one, uh, I think, um, um, like in the name, Donald Stuff did one about five years ago to, to yeah. list how this was going on. So this is um, one of the, this is kind of amazing to read. There's just some some cool information here. Uh, there were three three maintainers, but it was mostly Donald five years ago. And now um, there are still three maintainers, but there's it's Donald, uh, Ernest Dur Durbin, and Dustin Ingram all doing the maintainers, but there's also more people. So there's more people involved. There's uh, five different moderators and uh, three committers that, um, that help with the project. So that's nice. And we've all seen it. It's just people are using it a lot more, and it's a, it's a more central part of our everyday life. So... Um, yeah, and so then, what are some of the, you know, I remember one of the really interesting things was just how much it costs to run PyPI.org and the whole, like all the data transfer behind the scenes and stuff like that. Yeah, so let's let's jump to some of the data. The um, the data that uh, they showed was just sort of mind-blowing. Um, we've got um, uh, at one, we're up to 1.7 billion requests on PyPI per day. Uh, sometimes and uh, fifty five point four terabytes um, oh, every that's day, like five times more than even from twenty eighteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is uh, amazing amount of data goes through there, and then they have they have data on uh, files.pythonhosted.org. Uh, also, uh, there's some data on there. Um, the the money that goes into it uh, fastly takes care of a lot of the brunt of the work. So. Um, uh, Fastly apparently is donating about uh, what's the number 
$1.8 million of services a month uh, if we were to have to pay for the Fastly services directly. Oh, my uh, gosh. And they give, give PyPI a 100% discount, so that's great. And wow, that's about really ten. Cool. Ten thousand dollars worth of services a month from Google and uh, seven thousand from AWS, and then a whole slew of other people that help out too, like uh, Datadog, and, uh, which is cool. Um, uh, so, and then there's uh, some other funding sources uh, that we've had some grants, and we've talked about some of the grants that came through. But these are um, funding some some amazing projects, like the rewrite of uh, rewrite of PyPI. Uh, localization, some malware detection, which is really needed when everybody's depending on this. And now a support, some support staff, they're hiring a project project manager soon. So, yeah, that's um, fantastic. And Google came on as a visionary sponsor specifically to work on this and the security side of that, I believe. Yeah, um, the one of the things I didn't know about, which um, I'm, we're going to provide a link to, is the team maintains a a thing called a fundables uh, markdown page which is a, a non-exhaustive wish list of large projects they'd like to see happen. Uh, so oh, nice. be kind of, if you're kind of, it's sort of like a, you know, looking forward, what are we going to do? But it's, if we can do it, we'd like to do this. So that's kind of neat. That's amazing. I'd never stopped to think about how much work and, and how many people must use PyPy. PyPI. Yeah. I don't know how you, I yeah. say PyPy. Um, but like, you know, every time I type in PIP now, I'm going to think, differently <laughs> like it's just to just me it's just been there you. <laughs> you know, yeah now i feel like i should go to this fundables list and like pay i don't know like give something back for all the times i've used it probably in frustration as well um because something hasn't worked and not appreciated all the behind the scenes stuff so yeah the first time i learned about this i was blown away at how much <sighs> it takes to keep it going and how much you think about how much we all depend upon this as people working hmm. in python what if it went away tomorrow yeah, it was terrible. I can't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Most scientific research would probably collapse. <laughs> so you know, one don't. thing I wanted to ask you, Dr. Becky, is I suspect that you use Conda and Anaconda a lot in the data science mm -hmm. space, or are you a, are you a PIP person? I'm a PIP person. I don't really use Conda. Some of my colleagues do. It's all just personal preferences, really. I remember for a long time on the departmental computers, the ones that were owned by the physics department, they didn't give you like install control. And so PIP wouldn't work. And it drove me insane. <laughs> Oh wow! I had to beg them <laughs> to put PIP on. It was like, no, you can only install like uh, software that has been approved, like by the IT department. And I was just like, oh god, <laughs> this is not gonna work. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. that's really rough. Mm -hmm. All right, super cool. Well, I wanted to try to bring in some astronomy type things that have to do with nice. Python because, uh, of course, you're here, Doctor Becky, mm -hmm. and. Shaharin Ahmed didn't really know that he contributed this to today, but just more of a, a general conversation item put out on Twitter. Like, hey, I was looking for a Python generated at a star atlas like the Leuven star atlas. Have you heard of this thing? No, I haven't. Um, the Herschel star atlas is the most famous one, but I'm guessing Leuven is a bit of an update. It's, um, it's a project by uh, this person. I, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting their name. Let's see if I can. Uh, yeah, uh, they just say I am. I have to go back and pull that up later. <laughs> so sure. they wrote, they wrote this. <laughs> I doesn't help me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's um, the goal is to make a publication quality stellar atlas from scratch using Python. Wow. So it's pretty neat, and uh, the project's not finished, and who knows what the timeline is on it. But I wanted to just give it a shout out more as a way to think about what are the tools that people are using for astronomy and Python, and also just building maps. You know, maybe you want to build a map of something completely different. Like maybe you're really into river floating. You want to build like amazing maps of like river floating or whatever. Right? Like you could take the public data and like overlay the things kind of like they did here. So with this, I'll go and find some pictures down here at the end. It's, it's quite a long article talking about how all this works, but there's some really neat um, graphics that we can find. There we go. So. Yeah. They've, they've got pictures of stars, variable stars, galaxies, nebula, planetary nebula, and all kinds of um, things that you might care about. Fast-moving stars, I suspect a lot of those might be looping around black holes. What do you think? 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, you probably wouldn't see those astrometrically, but you probably get lots of variable stars that vary in brightness. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's they call cool. those out, particularly with like a a double circle type of icon. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, astrometrically means like the astro astronomy position so like incredibly precise so those kind of like what what you just described like a wobble from a black mm. hole orbiting it you probably wouldn't see on a star atlas like this it'd be like too fine of a detail like too right. much, too it. small of a change yeah yeah cool so talks about how do you go and create this thing it says there's a uh, one plot map.py that's a thousand five hundred lines long <laughs> trying to write all this together <laughs> they talk about using the different libraries so it was NumPy for all kinds of data handling. It was PyLab and Matplotlib. So all the graphics that you see here are just layers of Matplotlib renderings over and over wow. and over. Yeah, and then there was this library called BaseMap, which takes care of uh, projections and transformations because I, I think one of the challenges was how do you project this onto paper? <laughs> you know, when yeah. it's on you know a spherical thing. I think they uh, said they used stereographic projections. I don't know. It sounds about right, yeah. That sounds right, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. SciPy, and then, of course, AstroPy, which I know Dr. Becky used a lot, and then... Round of applause for AstroPy. <laughs> and then Pi EFM <laughs> for celestial mm -hmm. coordinate transformations. So, yeah, uh, a lot of neat not a lot of neat libraries on there. Uh, it sounds yeah. like you, I'm sure you use AstroPy. Like, any of the others sound familiar? Uh, all of them. I've used every single one of those packages before, um, especially AstroPy. Like I have the same problem with like I've taken an image with a telescope and it's been taken by a flat digital detector. But there's coordinates that are sort of overlaid on that that come from a, a, the sort of the surface of a sphere. You can think of it as right. And so then yeah. you project that down using AstroPy and PyFM as well, because sometimes people work in different coordinates. So you can work in sky coordinates, which is sort of how high you are above the horizon and how far around you are. Or you can work in galactic coordinates, like with respect to the center of the Milky Way, <laughs> like how far out are you and round. And I yeah, don't sure. ever work in those, but people, people who are Milky Way astronomers do. And then you've got to like, tr so some objects their coordinates are given in Milky Way coordinates and not sky coordinates. So they'll have to have done so many transformations to get maps like this. What's cool about this map, it's the constellation Cygnus, if you can see that yep. there. So that's uh -huh. the, the swan. It looks like a big cross in the northern sky. But that is the constellation or the area of the sky that the Kepler Space Telescope stared at. Oh, so nice. So that's of, where the exoplanets much, yeah. have been discovered. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. All of the exoplanets we know of, so some like 5,000 of them, will pretty much be in that patch of sky. So I'm really glad they chose that constellation. To, oh, yeah. To How show neat. This, this piece. Yeah. How neat. Yeah. And then over here, let's see if I can find it. Talked about the sources of data. There's all these different public sources of data that they put together. But then if you read through the article, you'll find that. They were talking about, well, I think they spent a month and a half getting this far on the project. And they're like, well, I went through here and I had to correct all of these things because they were, uh, this data was a little bit off here and that data was a little bit off there. And then I had to label them. And another thing that was talked about a lot is how do you uh, create these pictures without text that overlaps? So you mentioned this thing's called adjust life. text. And where it'll actually take a matplotlib thing with labels and then rearrange the labels on the graph so that the the text doesn't overlap, which is really cool and you has a nice. Just changed my life. Really? <laughs> yes. This is like Yay. a huge problem, and it this is it's been solved. It exists, and it's just Python code. God, I love yeah, this yeah. Stuff happens. Isn't this cool? So awesome. I'm well, just suddenly like jaw on the floor, like oh, someone figured it out. <laughs> so well, that's awesome. So yeah, there's there's a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that I really took away from this was it reminds me of this quote that in the whole data science, scientific computing world, like data cleaning isn't the grunt work. It is the work sort of thing because it's so much about, oh, yeah, I could just run these together. But then I spent a month fixing this and correcting that and offsetting that. And, yeah. So pretty neat. Mm, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I guess the know. I wonder okay. where I am in galactic coordinates. <laughs> Not zero, I, I zero. can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, Earth does have galactic coordinates. I just don't know what they are. <laughs> so is the supermassive black hole at the center of the universe, is that at zero, zero, zero? 
the center of our galaxy. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there's yeah. many galaxies in the universe. Our galaxy is the Milky Way. The supermassive black hole at the center of it would be, yes, L equals zero, B equals zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I guess final thought is the, they say it takes about four hours to generate this map running using wow. four cores running in parallel to actually render it because it has so much data and whatnot. But anyway, pretty neat. If you're looking to build maps with Python, here's a bit of a, a case study, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Is it open source? Like, is it on GitHub? Can you grab it yourself and have a play around? I wish. No, oh. it's not. I, I looked around. I couldn't find much of the code. There's little snippets of code shown. But yeah, that's that's all. I, I was thinking, like, can I get a section of Sky? I'm going to print it out. I'm going to frame it. It's going to look really cool. Exactly. Yeah, this <laughs> like, is the one I want to put on the wall. Yes. I, you, millennials like you love maps that. on walls. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> That's what I'm going to exactly. do. <laughs> All right. Before we move on this, just a quick shout out to Dr. Becky um, from Pride Fine on the live stream. Yay. Oh. Dr. Becky is back. Bought your book after watching on the live stream with Michael. Really enjoyed it, even though you don't have a space background. So very cool. That's awesome. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Speaking of things that we couldn't all enjoy and can take us back, calculators. Yes. Tell us about it. Uh I I was thinking about how I haven't I haven't thought about my graphical calculator in a long time. Like I swear I was attached at the hip to that thing throughout <laughs> high school and then a little bit into university, but not so much because they were like banned in our university exams because they thought that like it was it was help us cheat, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but like it was so weird going from high school where they were like, use your graphical calculators. And then at university they said, No, don't use them. Um and I remember thinking like after that I barely even thought about it. I don't even use it in my everyday like work or life anymore when a lot of the things I do I can just you know, use spotlight on my mac to, to, to do a quick calculation right. or whatever or I'll do it in terminal or something like that and then I saw this the other day and was just amazed by it because I remember this graphical calculator showing you, you could get up graphs of, you know, like e to the x or sine x or cos x or something on your calculator. But the screen like was, it was like a, an old Game Boy or like a Nokia 3310, <laughs> yeah. right? It was the most pixelated screen in the world. And making those graphs was so frustrating. Like it just wasn't intuitive. It, it wasn't fun, I didn't think. And then I saw this the other day where look at what like kids can use these days. <laughs> they have this graphical calculator that has this, you know, proper, beautiful, actual color screen and that you can use Python on to make plots and, and do calculations. And I just yeah. think this is such a fantastic idea because teaching kids to code early is, is so important. Like it can be used in so many different areas of work and life and science and everything like that. Um, but I always find learning to code without a purpose necessarily is really difficult. Like just deciding one day, I'm going to learn how to code. Where do you start? Like, unless you've got a project, like what do you do? So the idea of learning as you're going through and actually learning the math or learning the science with your graphical calculator is so good because then it, it just starts to come naturally to you. It's like the first thing you think of to do to solve a problem is to use Python. So I'm just so excited that this is a thing and I hope it becomes like the calculator that kids have to buy. Like yeah. if they're, if they're going to do maths at like a higher level or something. Um, yeah, so and cool. so, you, instead of those so weird uh, programming languages that they, that come, you know, like Polish notation reverse Polish notation and stuff like this is preparing them for proper programming. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that if you learn it in this way, it will just become so second nature that then it's not a barrier for you to go on and do anything else. Right. It just becomes a tool that you can use to solve problems like in science or in, you know, sort of uh, development or software development or something like that. As you get into university and, 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 world, and wider world, like having that knowledge from that age is is so good i mean i got mine at like 16 i don't know about if you guys remember when you got your graphical calculator but i feel like at that age yeah. i was impressionable and it stuck with me <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah i i think i might have gotten mine that really was a decent one right when i got to college but yeah i had mm. I even had one of the ti 93s that had a full cordy keyboard on it for a while it was that big one yeah that was that was fancy when i was a ta in grad school yeah that's yeah. the thing i think i got them early because we specialize early in the uk so like i was only doing maths and science by 16 and eight like 16 to 18 so that's why i got mine earlier um 
but yeah, like learning Python then would have been so helpful because I got to university and they were like, oh, okay, now time to learn Python. <laughs> but let's do it while we learn general relativity. <laughs> let's code up some general relativity. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm still printing Hello World. <laughs> like, one thing at a time. Like, down. <laughs> yeah. So, so the fact uh, you can learn it there here is so cool. How do you type into this thing, though? Very like slowly. A calculator. Very slowly, first of all. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I imagine it probably just has like an old uh, phone keyboard. So. You know, three letters per number, but it might have one of the full qwerties like Michael was talking about. So I think I think it's the more skinny tall ones, the more like an old phone. Uh, you know, it'd be mm -hmm. awesome if you could transfer Python files over. But yeah, it has like a REPL and everything, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Great. Yeah, I hope it'd have autocomplete. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> that would be great. Oh yeah, I hadn't even thought about that, but yes, it it had better. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a couple of comments from the live stream. Marcel says Polish notation is the opposite of method chaining. Yeah, and Kim says graphical calculators would have been really handy in high school. I never even seen one before I uh, got into engineering. Python and reverse Polish notation sounds tricky. And then <laughs> Pamphil Roy uh, from the SciPy world it, uh, says, oh, yeah. And, um, they also told me you can't put things like SciPy on there, sadly. But hopefully, hopefully soon. Maybe this is just, you know, V1. Uh, mm. But yeah, I, I guess yeah. packages in general, right? They talk about having Turtle and stuff, but, you know, I'm not sure how mm. much. They have add -on but how modules. cool would it how cool would it be to have SciPy on there? Because then you could like plot a function and then you could like optimize and you could like find the solutions to a function that way. Yeah. <laughs> Probably skipping the differential equations that you're supposed to be learning in maths. <laughs> exactly. But those partial differential <laughs> equations are easy. I just say like <laughs> solve and give it the number. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it would check your answers with SciPy. I, I think turtles kind of neat on there also. Um because I, I mean I programmed sub hunt on my uh single line uh, reverse polish notation hp calculator um just because i could sort of thing so i think doing some games in there might be kind of neat but. yeah yeah people definitely agrees with you about how cool that would be <laughs> yeah awesome all right before we move on to the next one I'll let me tell you about our sponsor this week so this episode of Python Bytes is brought to you by Sentry. I love Sentry. We use Sentry. So how would you like to remove a little stress from your life? Do you worry that users might be having difficulties or encountering errors with your app right now? Would you even know if they did until they send that email? How much better would it be to have error or performance details immediately sent to you, including call stacks, uh, tracebacks, values of local variables, and even the logged in user that ran into the error? With Sentry, it's not just possible, but it's simple. We use Sentry, like I said, on all of our web apps on Python Bytes and Talk Python, Talk Python training courses. And I actually ran, had somebody run into an error. I got a Sentry notification that this user had a problem doing this thing. I fixed it and sent them an email. And they said, oh, that is incredible. I was about to email you about this problem I had, but it was late. So I was going to do it tomorrow. And you already fixed it. So what a surprise. So surprise and delight your users today. Create your Sentry account at pythonbytes.fm slash Sentry. And when you sign up, please, there's a button that says get a promo code. Make sure that you enter Python Bytes, all caps, all one word in there, and you'll get the team plan, which gives you more features and more errors and so on. Not that you want more errors, but maybe more features is good. So Python Bytes out of M slash Sentry and promo code Python Bytes. Brian, uh, you got the next one. Okay. Um, I got to say, though, that the, gr the artwork on that Get Sentry page was great. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. Well done. Um, so I so I've been trying to to shift uh, doing a little bit more work uh, with GitHub Actions on my projects, and but you know and it, there's probably great documentation somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Uh, so and I'm impatient. So I, I kind of want somebody to just say for Python, this is what you do. So there's a, a few of these walkthroughs, but I I, I like this one that I just saw recently. Um, this one's Python package. Uh, CI CD with GitHub Actions, you know, just write what it says on the tin. Uh, but this is a um, kind of a nice walkthrough uh, of all the different, some of the different things. And they're, they're going through an example project, uh, of course, um, but it's nice. Uh, the, the, they go talks, uh, first off talks about um, kind of when you want actions to happen. So in, in, in talking about when they happen, that this project happens on pull request and on push to uh, certain branches. So in this case, main branch, 
but you really could pick uh, several branches that you could do this on and uh, and to have actions happen on those. I, I kind of like having a couple different development branches, especially on things that I'm active on and don't want to release yet. So these are nice. Um, and then uh, what else? I'm going through a matrix of stuff. So this most of the articles talking about uh, syntax checking on different things. I don't know if really that's important, but I would probably do a, a PyTest on multiple uh, multiple matrices. So, but the matrix, the notion of a matrix is kind of interesting. The having um, uh, the different environments. So, in this case, um, the, this person is talking about maybe running on multiple versions of Python across Ubuntu, Mac OS, and Windows. And that's that's exactly what I want. Uh, those, those sorts of combinations to make sure something's working. So with um, all the, the devices and stuff that you have, uh, do you see this maybe for something that work as well, like with all the hardware devices and the different ways it's configured? Um, well, couldn't use couldn't use GitHub Actions, but we definitely use matrices to uh, to figure out which you know which tests have to run on different configurations of different hardware, and it's just exploding. But um, yeah, that's a different nightmare. Uh, <laughs> but this one is taken care of for you, so it's it's a, a neat a, a neat thing to to test across all those um and you know i knew how to do it on talks and i knew how to do it on travis and getting it to work on github actions is just different it's not harder it's just different so i appreciate this walkthrough um and then uh what uh, going through running example of running tests of course and checking artifacts which is interesting i, I hadn't thought about that there's you know your build might generate doc, you know documents or or other artifacts that you want to keep around um, having some checks around those is a good idea too. Um, and then a couple, the last couple of bits and, and really why I'm highlighting this is because I, I didn't really know how to do this is doing auto merges on some branches. So there's some branches that you like, maybe you're maintaining and nobody else has access to, but if you push to that, you want tests to run and then automatically to merge to something, um, and have it setting up auto merge. Um, uh, there's some, some steps around that, which is, it's pretty darn cool. And the last bit is um, uh, pushing to PyPI. So releasing oh, nice. um, release automation so you can automatically, uh, in, in this case, setting up a rule so that if you push the a tag that starts with a V, that means you've updated the version and you want that to push automatically out to PyPI. So hooking that up with GitHub Actions. Is oh, that's clever. I'd never thought about triggering it off of a tag name. I've always thought of it just certain branch means go. But yeah, this is that's clever. Yeah. So that way you can even even have a, like a main branch that has updated workflow, updated things, but it's not. It doesn't get pushed until there's a new version, which makes sense. Yeah. So. Dr. Becky, what's the story with uh, GitHub Actions and all of your colleagues? People use it? Oh, you're muted. I had a drink and I spared you from hearing me gulp before. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think I know what I've used GitHub Actions, to be quite honest. Um, I'm sure some of my colleagues have. I use GitHub all the time, obviously, but GitHub Actions? Mm, trying yeah. to remember. I don't think so. Yeah, nice. I'm sure somebody has though. But no, yeah, I'm sure I some haven't. people maintain some of the packages and stuff. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I don't think I have anything like that um, to maintain. A lot of my colleagues put out stuff, but really, my code is for sort of my like, use and for any yeah. specific colleague that has like a science case use for it. Um, but yeah. GitHub, I mean, I love GitHub because uh, one of the things I love doing with it is committing when I've written like a scientific paper. I'll, I'll even put the latex on on GitHub, the, the what we co what we sort of code our scientific writing in, right? Um, and the PDF is included in your commits, and then you can make a GIF from your commit history of like your PDF, like building up, like adding parts oh, and all the cool. words adding. It's one of my favorite things to do once I've finished because it feels like it's it's like oh, I've done this project and now I can like see it fully take form. And um, I remember I wrote my thesis my entire PhD thesis in about two months because I got a job and I had to finish my PhD and I had to write it up. <laughs> and I don't remember much from that whole two month time. It's, it's a, it's a huge blur except one vivid memory of the fire alarm going off <laughs> in the department and being like, panic, <laughs> get commit. Get <laughs> like, I was, I was 
<laughs> remember this i've got this one commit message in my thesis repo that's basically just i just mullet the keyboard because <laughs> that's just like the fire alarm's going off I can't commit anything <laughs> and get pushed because I was like, what if, like, what if I don't have a backup of like the past eight hours of writing I've just done? It was a huge bulk, and I was just like, I'm not losing this. And people were like pulling me out of the room. You've got to run coming. away. Oh my gosh. It was that's totally so fine. But oh. yeah, that mm. reminds me of a uh, sign I saw once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly in case of fire one get commit two get pushed three leave building <laughs> i i actually went through this but during a phd thesis write-up which i would never recommend to anybody <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm amazed that you found this image so fast so <laughs> oh yeah no problem I, i'm on i, I got you Couple yeah. of comments from the live stream. Uh, Justin Boyce says, "Love being able to use GitHub Actions for deployment. Keeps me from botching deployment by making mistakes." I agree. Do it more often if it's automatic. Mm -hmm. And then Jared Chung says, "Looks great. Definitely going to hook this up to the packages I maintain, but which change infrequently, so you don't have to remember the workflow and so on." And then finally, Marcel Milson says, "I heard GitHub is now offering free tier for institutions with unlimited contributors for private repos and two thousand dollars or two thousand actions a month for zero dollars." So, yeah, that yeah, goes alongside cool. with the academics uh, package as well, right? For students, it's not just students; it's also anybody with like a .edu email or .ac.uk, which is the universities over here. So I have like a loads of free repos and stuff like that, which is great. Oh, so good. Yeah, fantastic. Cool, cool. All right, moving on to number five. Not this one, this one. So <laughs> Another <we're>, spacey one. <laughs> another spacey one. Uh, Garrett Dunn uh, gave us a shout out saying SpaceX is now using Python for prototyping their Starlink satellite software, which I don't know how, um, how you feel about Starlink. Uh, Starlink. Dr. Becky, I mean, as an astronomer, it's like in your way, but as a way to empower people in remote places, it's kind of cool. I'm really split about it, to be honest, because I want it to go ahead. I think it's a really cool project, but I think there's more compromises need to be made in order to for it to work in the way that it yeah. could, like the most efficiently, the way that it could. And I know, like, even before this launched, you, I'd take an image, you know, and I'll end up with a satellite trail and you know at least one of 10 i've taken you know at a telescope oh, that wow. evening so and there's going to be more right exactly yeah and it's not like something you can remove people are like i'll oh, just remove it as a source of noise if that thing goes like right over your you know 15 minute exposure of a galaxy that's billions of light years away and this massive bright thing just goes <laughs> like right over the middle it ruins it right there's no rescuing that so I do want it to go ahead. I do want it to work. But it's really cool that they're going to use Python. Like, that could be something we could get warnings from, you know, like if it's something yeah. as accessible as Python. So to say something's going over, pause observation, carry on or something like that, you know. Yeah, I would actually love to see SpaceX work more closely with all mm -hmm. the satellite and, uh, locations, uh, observatories and say, all right, mm -hmm. here, here's how we're going to help you solve this problem. Yeah. That would right, be great. Dive, yeah, di diving into this. So Stack Overflow actually did a four-part series on the software that um, SpaceX used to build all of their things in space. And this one in particular is about the network protocols. So if you look at how the Starlink system works, it turns out that most of the stuff is C++, both on the ground systems and the things in the sky. So they talk about... Um, that their software breaks into two parts, software that flies and software that supports the things that fly. <laughs> so the software that flies is all C++ that's on embedded chips on the satellites. But then on the ground, there's a whole bunch of communication APIs and coordination APIs. If you look over at where these satellites are and where they're covering, there's these cool real-time maps. And I'll, I'll put one on the screen here. You can actually see them flying by here where Brian and I are at least i'll zoom in on that area and you can see the overlap of the signals of the different ones and how they're oriented and all kinds of stuff so they need to adjust and move these satellites around in orchestration and orchestrate them basically so the software that does that it's in production version in c plus plus but they do a lot of simulations and prototyping in python to figure out how that works because you know think about the in-body problem but for 
thousands or hundreds of thousands of these things to keep them all working together, the combinatorics of it get out of control really quick, they say. So there's a lot of simulations that need to be done, and they do that in Python. And once they get the working version, then they rewrite that in C++. What do you two think? This is a cool picture, right? Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. That is neat. Yeah, and speaking of GitHub Actions, they probably are actually using GitHub for this, but I, I, <laughs> it doesn't explicitly say. But you think of organizations that have a hard time deploying their code, like you'll go to a website, like our website is down all of Sunday because we're de deploying a new version. Like, are you kidding me? This is 2021. Like, this should be Git push, wait a few seconds, and it's now the new version. Anyway, this uh, is pretty interesting because they say the software is developed in a continuous integration environment with teams merging into the master development branch often and deploying to all of the satellites weekly. Huh. <laughs> that, that adds an extra level of panic to you get pushed, doesn't it? Like, it definitely <laughs> does. Oh, whoops, I wasn't ready. All the so satellites stopped responding. Whoops. <laughs> so yeah, it says Don't the Python good. version allows them to wrap uh, for rapid iteration during the design phase. And once it's all happy, they write in C++. So yeah, anyway, pretty cool. I'll link to some of these these maps that track it and the four part series and so on. So Garrett, thank you for that. It's yeah. really cool to see because it's very similar to what um, Space Telescope uh, are doing for the James Webb Space Telescope. So sorry, Space Telescope is the institution in Baltimore that uh -huh. manages like the Hubble Space Telescope and the new one that's going to hopefully launch in October is called the James Webb Space Telescope. And I think that's a similar sort of platform in that a lot of the spacecraft sort of mechanics is done with the, the sort of the usual comms that they have possibly C++, but a lot of the tools they put together for astronomers who are planning observations, like where to point, how long that will take, uh, and all those kind of th things when they're sort of deciding, I want to use this to do this science, that's all been done in Python. Like all of the uh, sort of tutorials of like how to figure out how much like James Webb Space Telescope be able to see of this thing you want to look at is all done in like IPython notebooks, Jupyter, I guess we should call them now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's really cool to see that, like it's you know, it's it's not just like these major academic institutions that are picking up Python because they know it's the academics that use that, but it, it's companies like SpaceX as well, I guess, because they know their employees like work well with yeah. Python. Um, yeah. So. Oh, that's really cool. I I knew a lot of the telescopes were using Python, but um, and that's going to be a, a massive new telescope. The James Webb Telescope is going to it's going to be a big deal, right? Yeah, it's going to be a huge deal. Um, we've all got fingers crossed that launch actually happens because it was originally planned for 10 years ago and three years ago and five years ago. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, fingers crossed, I guess, for coming mm -hmm. soon. All right. Yeah. Dr. Becky, you got the next one. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I've, I've done the, the scientist thing of bringing a scientific paper to a Python podcast, but I, I'm bringing <laughs> what I know. Um, so I found this, this paper a while back when I was sort of, you know, doing the the thing of like you're an expert in something because you know what to google um when i was looking for something and i found this paper the beginner's guide to working with astronomical data and it's very much written as if you're you know a poor phd student that's come in and your your, your professor has said hey here's a lot of data please analyze it and you're like i don't know where to start so that's kind of who it's written for and i think if you are a really keen amateur astronomer and i know a lot of people do want to get in it do want to get into astrophotography and possibly did during the pandemic with lockdowns and, and stay at home orders and perhaps might have set up something with like a raspberry pi you know to to control a telescope uh, to know where it's pointing something like that or even to to adapt it with a camera as well and then they have all these images that they then want to remove noise and and get like a, a beautiful color image of something as well and they're not entirely sure how to do it but they might know python i use python to you know analyze the images that come off the back of professional telescopes so you could do it with amateur telescopes or amateur cam you know just an slr camera you've set up in your back garden to take an image of something um but you want to see fainter and fainter things so you have to take lots and lots of like short images so you don't get you know motion blur and stuff like that with the with actually the rotation of the earth but they're all the wrong coordinates so what do you do because so, they're not all in the same place so you use astropy to figure out you know how to do this it, does it like realign the images uh, to adjust for that rotation and stuff? exactly yeah oh, yeah you can fantastic. do that and so but there's obviously lots of other steps that you need to do like taking out noise so this actually talks through like all of the steps that would go into what a professional would do 
And I, reading it, I think it's so well written that I think someone who is a really keen amateur and who wants to get into astrophotography and do the, you know, reduction, as we call it, of the images, you know, make them look extra pretty by the end of it with Python, because they're a keen Python person. I think this would be the thing to be like, right, I'm going to make this my bedtime reading. It's it's very, very long, but I think you could definitely make this like a project if if someone was keen enough to do. And so that's why I thought I'd I'd bring it. And I feel like obviously we need a huge shout out to AstroPy and Mapotlib and everything like that for making these kind of things possible with, you know, images that you can take in your back garden and and, and stuff that you can get at. But you know this, you know, someone in a in a month or so, if they're really keen on Python and they're really keen on taking photos of the night sky. You could be getting images of galaxies and nebula oh. that look amazing, you know. So that'd that's why amazing. I thought I'd bring print it. them out. Yeah, print it out and put it up as artwork <laughs> in your house or something. That'd be fantastic. It didn't, instead yeah. of just saying that's a that's a cool picture of a galaxy, like mm -hmm. I took that picture of that galaxy. That's totally different. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I can imagine someone getting an amazing picture of Andromeda, you know, and, and following these steps that it outlines. And I think it's easier because, especially if you know Python, there's no learning curve with a new tool or a new, or like frustration with a, a GUI, right? That's just this like oh, interface, what's going on? I don't know how to use it. Because it's just pure Python. I think it, if you already know Python, it's definitely the easiest way to get into this because it'll be something familiar with, with something new. Um, so yeah. even though it's a scientific yeah. paper, <laughs> it, would, it would pass. So <laughs> yeah, it looks super interesting. The code doesn't look terribly challenging, but you know it's exactly what you need to solve the problems, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, I think that's it for our six items. Brian, you got anything? No, I just apologize to the stream people. For some reason, my video stream is frozen. I, I so. think uh, that you might just be really, really <laughs> zen and still. I thought he was just really interested in the paper, boy. He was like, wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> You've mesmerized him, absolutely. All right, so before we move on, actually, Justin Boy says, uh, thanks for bringing this, Dr. Becky. I did pick up astrophotography barely as a hobby during the pandemic, and it looks good. So yeah, already, I already got one yeah, person think... into it. Taking that like bigger step to go from like, oh, cool, like I managed to photograph some stars to getting like the galaxies and nebula. I think this will this will help people take that step, I think. So, yeah, for sure. I'm glad, I'm glad right, it I helped. Got a, all right. I got a couple of quick shout outs at the end. First, I want to point out that if you like this conversation, check out episode 303 of Talk Python, where Dr. Becky and I dive all into the Python astronomy world. That was fun. And then I just met uh, with uh, one of the founders of this company called Kubuntu Focus, which I thought was a pretty interesting idea. So the what they're going for is, tr you know, the way that Apple works is, right, you know, they make the Mac and then they make Mac OS. And that tight integration of those two things works better than just, you know, bringing pieces together and building your own sort of thing, right? So that's sort of the same idea, but for Linux. And so it's really focused on people who do AI type of work or just want to have a really good desktop Linux environment. So for example, down here at the bottom, keeping it in the uh, space uh, world, we have Chris Matman, who if I refresh it, it'll come up at the right time maybe. And it's supposed to cycle around. Anyway, Chris Matman said he, who works at JPL, who he did some machine learning training on his MacBook Pro and it took like 37 hours. And on this thing, because they have these crazy GPUs, these like GeForce 3080s and stuff in the laptop, they did it in like an hour and a half instead of oh. 37 hours or whatever it was. So, and by the way, you can actually buy it. Like these, these new GeForce chips or cards, they're basically unobtainium, right? You can't get to them. Uh, so yeah, anyway, pretty, pretty interesting if you're looking for a desktop Linux world, check that out. Uh, Dr. Becky, anything you would like to give a shout out to? Maybe I could throw out your Amazon page. Uh, anything yeah, else? Sure. Anything else? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I've written a book. Um, so it's got different names everywhere in the world just to confuse everybody. So um, in the US <laughs> and Canada, it's called Space at the Speed of Light. Uh, in the UK and pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's space 10 things you should know. And then there's also the, the German edition as well, which yeah, I'll not try and von Grossen Knall. Grossen Knall. Yeah, exactly. It's a good book title. Um, it's, it's essentially, it's written for 
I think anyone who is a complete beginner in space but has always maybe been a little bit curious would love this book. It, it's like a the 10 things that if you were going to be at a dinner party and you'd be like, hey, did you know this? Like, these are the things you should know about space, right? Yeah, but I also yeah. think I that think anybody who's... About it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also think anybody who's been keen on space as well will also get a kick out of it um, because it takes ideas that you might have heard before, but then it just adds in a little extra level um, of like where we are right now on the edge of like our understanding of this thing. So um, it's a really short read as well. Um, it's not heavy. It's not a big hefty thing. It's really skinny. I, my laptop's currently propped on top of it. Otherwise I would show you how skinny <laughs> it is, but I, I disrupt everything. Um, so um, yeah, if, if people want to check that out, uh, please do. Or if you have like, I don't know, an, an, an uncle or an aunt or a, a nephew or a niece or whatever that you think would uh, would like that. Um, yeah, it, I've been told it's a good gift. So <laughs> yeah. Rahan asks, is it really big? Nope. It's not that no. big. <laughs> it's about Proud 200 Van, pages or so. Yeah, Proud Van <laughs> says, I can vouch for the book. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you, Brad Van. And then uh, also says uh, that Brian <laughs> imported Zen. <laughs> <It's your face. laughs> I like well, that. I've, got a, I've got a close friend that does has a telescope, and he mm -hmm. always wants to talk about space, and I know nothing. So I'm definitely going to read this book so I can talk to him. So, there you yeah, go. Fantastic. Yeah, perfect for that. Um, All right. I have – we always close out the – the show with a joke, but I I went and found some space memes because Dr. Becky is here and you've done a couple of videos on reacting to space memes. And so I thought maybe some space memes would be appropriate as our joke. Yeah, for that's the week. so fun because people click on them and they're like, I just learned more in this 15 minute video about space memes that I did in my entire <laughs> high school career of <laughs> physics. And I'm like, that was always my intention. <laughs> I draw you in with the memes and then I hit you with the science. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's so good. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can link to some of the the proper uh, ones you've done. There's a lot. So I'm going to throw out four quick little uh, space memes. Mm -hmm. I think four is it. So I got to remember what the names. I, I gave them each a title. So the first one is Uber. So there's Matt Damon <laughs> sitting on ours alone. Remember, he gets abandoned there. And he says, where's my Uber? And then there's the Elon Musk Rosedry shot in the spaces. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whose definition of minute that is. But, um, <laughs> it's gonna be why, a while. Seriously, why did they launch a Tesla into space? Every time I'm reminded that they did this, I'm like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> I know. But why? There's no reason. Because they could. Exactly. I think that they never just because they could, they never stopped to think whether they should. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's the, the same company that uh, is rocking Dogecoin, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next one. This one called Flaws. Spaceship design. Here's a picture of a spaceship with a cutout so you can see inside. It says, when building a spaceship, the tiniest details are crucial. For example, this spaceship may be flawed because it has a giant <laughs> hole in the side. <laughs> That's I awesome. love Brian's like Brian's like squeak <laughs> laughing. That's the level he's reading. That's awesome. <laughs> and yet he's still very great. still in the I, <laughs> I do love these like they're like a hybrid between a really scientific diagram and then something you would put out to the public or use in a talk or something like that. And I remember the the um the ELT, the extremely large telescope that we're building, which I know is a stupid name. They used emperor penguins for scale next to it <laughs> in, in like the public image. I was like, who, first of all, who knows how big an emperor penguin is? <laughs> is that like a knee height? Is that a waist? What are we talking here? <laughs> Apparently it was because the, on average, an emperor penguin is a meter high. So they were like, oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, it's a can, meter. It's like a meter rule. And I was like, yeah, but nobody knows that. Like, just put a human. <laughs> Uh, Dean links him out there in the live stream says, boy, the mileage on that Tesla, Tesla would make it really hard to resell. I agree. I like that. All right. The next one is distracted. There's a cat in a space suit. Staring. <laughs> it says, mesmerized by the red dot on the wall. Missed space launch. <laughs> I'm now wondering if there's been any like cat astronauts in, in previous. There's been dog astronauts. Yeah, there have, been yeah. Monkey astronauts, but... I don't know if we've ever sent a cat think, to space. I propose a new thing. Like maybe a cat could spend some time on the International Space Station. Just 
Think of all the memes and all the funny videos. <laughs> I don't think it would have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine like <laughs> it constantly tries to like have its like hackles raised, with its, like, but it can't because it's in zero G. So it just... <laughs> goes in a small circle really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe you know how they there's those videos online where they put like sellotape on the back of a cat and it constantly like crouches to go under yeah. something that's not there maybe it would do something like that like i don't know <laughs> i'm really intrigued now a cat in zero g what would it do <laughs> but phil says uh congo tried to send a rat and once they've sent a rat, they're going to need a cat to solve the rat in space problem. <laughs> and, and they said, also, uh, Justin says, space toilets are hard. Space litter boxes are nearly impossible. And Sam Worley is like, I, you really think they could get a cat to go into a space rocket? <laughs> the minute they open the door, the minute they open the door of the space rocket, the cat will just dart into, onto the bed where you can't get it. Like, <laughs> like when you dig it into the bed. Oh. All right, let's round it out with the last one. Space Vegas. There's a black <laughs> hole. What happens in a black hole stays in a black hole. Nice. Space Vegas. I like it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I know we talked about this one before, but it made it in a second time. I guess instead of Sin City, would it be like Bin City? Because yeah. Spin City? Yeah. I don't know. Spin Something. City. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, Something like perhaps. that. <laughs> Things rotate as they go into the black hole, right? They don't just go straight. Do they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually really, really hard to grow a black hole and make stuff fall in, which everyone's always really surprised at because they think they're mm -hmm. like hoovers. But most stuff just orbits them, like the Earth orbits the sun. It's just a kind of a heavier sun that we can't see, right? So most stuff yeah. orbits, it doesn't fall in, and it's, it takes a lot of effort to make stuff fall in. So nice. Well, once it's in, it stays there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Getting it out. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, Dr. Becky, thanks for being here. It was really great to have you and Brian. Thanks Thank as always. You. Good to be with you. Yeah, you bet. Bye, everyone.